Good afternoon. Welcome to the virtual forum on telehealth opportunities and challenges for physician practices during the COVID-19 emergency and beyond. This is Nancy Kazak. I'm director of the Illinois Telehealth Initiative of the Partnership for a Connected Illinois frequently known as PCI. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We have a very rich agenda of exciting topics to be discussed, but before we get to that program, I would like to thank McDonald Hopkins for hosting. In particular, I would like to thank Rick Hindman, a healthcare attorney with McDonald Hopkins, who has taken leadership on this event and has worked close to probably for a full month on pulling this together. So we really appreciate this. And uh, the, the richness of this program is in large part due to his the fine work that he has done. I'd also like to thank the supporting nonprofit organizations who publicize this forum, Connected Health Initiative, eHealth uh, Initiative and Foundation, the Illinois State Medical Society, and the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center. It's these organizations that have reached out to many people uh, in, and invited them uh, to participate today. I'd like to thank our speakers. We have many local experts, but we have others from around the country, from Boston, Washington, DC, North Dakota, and Texas. And in particular, I'd like to thank the frontline healthcare workers who risk their lives to care for us during this pandemic. A few business items. There are handouts, which you can see uh, on, your, um, uh, on your, your screen, and you can download two of them. We also are, will be having a recording of this, which will be available after the event. It will be sent to all the attendees. There will be a survey sent to all attendees to get their thoughts on future topics or, or topics for future forums. Uh, and the panelists will not be able to take live questions during this discussion. However, they will be happy to address questions from the audience at the conclusion of our panel. You can submit your questions by emailing to events at mcdonaldhopkins.com at any time during the event or during the webinar. The, this address is on the bottom of each slide or of most of the slides um, you will be seeing. So with that, I want to turn it, turn it over to Rick Heinemann, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Rick. Thank you, Nancy, and welcome to our webinar. We're going to be focusing on ways in which uh, physicians have been expanding their use of telehealth during the COVID-19 emergency, as well as some related opportunities and challenges for physician practices. We're going to start out with a, a keynote address by Brian Scarpelli. Uh, Brian is Senior Policy Counsel for ACT, the APT Association's Connected Health Initiative where he leads the, the, the initiative in advocating for improved for improving connected health technology through updates to reimbursement, security, privacy, and, and, and efficiency. Uh, prior to joining CHI, Brian worked with Telecommunications Industry Association and prior to that, Federal Communications Commission. Uh, if, to set the stage for our panels, uh, Brian will be providing some background and overview of digital health opportunities and needs as well as potential for a, a, you know, for, for a public help for, for some emergency allowances to become permanent. Brian? Well, thank you so much. Uh, excellent, okay. Thank you so much, Rick. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and uh, yes, hi everyone. I'm Brian Scarpelli uh, with the Connected Health Initiative. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and I, again, I, I too, uh, can only just echo what, what Nancy, uh, was just saying there. Uh, I, I thank you, McDonald Hopkins, uh, Broadband Illinois PCI and, uh, and my experience over the years with the Illinois telehealth initiative has been nothing but positive. It's a wonderful forum. And, and I think the, the very strong attendance here today is, uh, evidence of the value there. Um, our discussion here couldn't be more timely. I mean, I, I'm I'm just excited to be able to speak to you briefly before you get into uh, get into the panels. Just as a very brief background about who the connected, who is my org, right? Um, uh, and and why is it relevant to your all's considerations? We're a uh, we're a not-for-profit, multi-stakeholder, consensus-based policy and legal advocacy organization based in Washington D.C. 
uh, whose goal is to improve, uh, to enable the uptake of digital health tools widely, um, whether uh, across any and all opportunities, whether um, whether incremental and condition specific and um, buried in a regulation or uh, broad sweeping and um, and in a uh, in a in a statute or anything in between. Um, the, the the what informs our positions and our advocacy is a really I think I should mention is a really interesting mix of of uh, of stakeholders that we 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 have populated a steering committee with. And I just briefly to describe it to give you an idea of where I'm coming from um, is that it's not just industry, right? I mean, there's we have we we made a, a very we, we made a very um, uh, special effort to um, incorporate the physician and, and, and clinician viewpoint um, into our advocacy, and for that reason, we're happy to work with, for example, the American Medical Association. Um, there, uh, there is uh, a, a wide range of, of uh, commercial interests, uh, startup, small businesses, uh, some larger companies, all addressing a wide range of use cases in the digital healthcare space. Again, some rather condition agnostic, you know, for example, the development of software platforms that enable the, um, the sharing and utilization of patient generated health data, regardless of the uh, condition and others very focused on specific use cases such as medication adherence and other things like that. Um, payer community, think tanks, patient groups, um, and even just uh, tech, whether you wanna uh, call it that or not, larger companies that are starting to do more um, in the healthcare space such as, as Apple and Microsoft. So anything that I'm talking about here and advocating on, I describe that very briefly to illustrate that, that there's a thread of consensus across those communities informing it, <laughs> which is um, which is uh, really great. Um, generally, I think uh, you know, as we're even public health emergency aside, uh, you know, general mantra with a lot of the incorporation of new technologies into healthcare settings is um, is uh, around efficacy and one efficacy and 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 the effectiveness. Um, does it work? Um, also. Where are the incentives provided? And namely, that translates to who's getting paid what to, to do what uh, in the value chain. And then uh, third is 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 liability. <laughs> uh, not to besmirch my own profession, but uh, but the legal aspects and liability aspects, of course, are very important here. And I'm I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir and saying that, just mentioning it very briefly. And uh, and you know the that mantra for us translates into a wide range of of uh, of of uh, streams of advocacy across the reimbursement and payment landscape with respect to privacy and security issues, uh, health data interoperability and data flows, um, key regu uh, regulators like the FDA's approach to emerging technologies that may happen to meet the definition of a medical device, which is quite broad, and uh, and even some more proactive for, you know, just kind of big, big think pieces such as what is the, the, the responsible way for policymakers to, to um, think about the role of, of artificial intelligence? And I put that in quotes too, because I know it can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people uh, in the future of healthcare. So if we go to the next slide, uh, I think there's a graphic. Yeah, that uh, we can even go to the next slide there. There we go. Uh, you can see a list, and, and I don't intend to read all these to you all. I'm sure you're you're probably relative, pretty familiar with the with the fact that that at both the federal and the state level, there's been a wide range of policy changes that have been enacted, many, almost all, for with respect to COVID-19 for for the duration of the public health emergency, and that's really important. And um, and it's um, uh, you can see some of these listed here that are fall into some of the buckets that I uh, just mentioned before. Payment, such as Medicare telehealth services expansion by CMS for Medicare. Some other uh, communications-based technology services, such as virtual check-ins and e-visits, um, uh, and various uh, uh, loosening of requirements and allowances across key programs, such as Medicare Advantage. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I would think about it. There's there's a great there's a slew of them. There's a lot of there's a lot that 
policymakers at the federal and state level have done to enable um, digital, the, the digital health tools uh, that are available today to be used to tackle the public health emergency. And that's something that is, uh, they should be applauded for, I think. Um, there's enablements where they're provide, like for example, providing new payments. And then um, if the opposite of that is disablements, there's, uh, <laughs> there's, um, there's been policy changes to uh, temporarily, um, uh, you know, through typically through enforcement discretion, provide more flexibility on key liability questions, such as um, such as the Office of the Inspector General's uh, HHS's OIG um, decision to um, to use enforcement discretion with respect to HIPAA and the Stark laws, for example, um, when um, when a provider can demonstrate that they're uh, acting in good faith. Um, I think the next slide might list a couple more things I can reference if we jump to that. Uh, yeah, um, there we go. Ah, well, that's our uh, that's the makeup of our steering committee there. <laughs> there we go. And if, if you go to the there we go. The next slide um, is um, uh, there. Uh, undoubtedly, you know, while there's uh, been a great many changes that ha that have been made, we have a lot of haps, but there continue to be some needs. No, no question about that. And uh, and I think uh, you know both these haves and needs will be explored by um, by folks with far more practical experience than than me, people on the front lines who we should all be uh, supporting and applauding. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and, and you can see some of them, some of those further needs listed here, um, such as the anti-kickback statute, um, I think some broader clarifications with respect to HIPAA and emerging technologies and, and other issues like that. Um, you know, I, I believe that's my last slide, but uh, what, what I guess I would what I what I would ask next is oh there we go yeah and this is a, this graphic is probably as good as any to <laughs> carry me through the end of my remarks which is where does this you know leave us and take us um, I think um, we you know I, I I do I do you know I think we all know that at some point at a federal level and at the state level the public health emergency is going to expire and not be renewed you know. And so, um, so you wonder about all of these, um, and, and, and I should say, and, and in some jurisdictions, that uh, the, the, the phasing back to normal, whatever that is, and I think that will be a very interesting angle that will be explored across the panels. Uh, but the, the phasing back to non-emergency status is has occurred, or or is concurring, uh, is occurring. Um, I would argue to you. And I encourage people to uh, let me know if they disagree with this. <laughs> but, and to be fair, not to build the suspense too much, I'm kind of uh, parroting what somebody else had posited to me. But I do happen to agree with it. And it's that, you know, there's a lot of us who have been advocating for policy changes at various levels to enable greater use of technology, whether it's live voice video telehealth and Medicare, whether it's remote patient monitoring, Storm Forward, eHealth, mHealth, you name it. Um, for many years, some people for 15, 20 years, you know, and uh, but it seems to me that more has been done to enable the use of digital tools in providing healthcare widely uh, in the last four months than the last decade. Um, and you know, of course, that now that could uh, expire. So the question of permanence uh, does come up. And what will be made permanent? I think there's a, there's an awesome panel that you'll see later today where I think they're going to really look to tackle that. Uh, but uh, I would suggest that uh, the permanence of the allowance is made at all the different levels will depend on not only the data but your stories and your experiences, um, and how effectively both positive and negative. And how effectively they're communicated to the policymakers, which I think are going to be forced to very rapidly address the practical reality that many enablements have been provided and capabilities have been unlocked. Even simple like capabilities that we've been using for years, like a FaceTime call or a video call, where previously they were not supported at all, except in limited circumstances by, for example, the Medicare system, are now widely enabled. And the longer the public health emergency goes on, the longer people get used to them. Set the law aside. It is 
quite a quandary that I think a policymaker would find itself in is if the public health emergency expires, are you going to walk into a uh, into the home of a Medicare beneficiary in rural Illinois and tell them, yeah, you remember the, how you used to have to drive an hour and a half each way to your specialist to get care once a month it's a, or some, some interval like that. Um, and more recently, we allowed you to, account, to, to have those benefits furnished to you via a video call. Well, the public health emergency is over, so you can no longer do that. So gas up your car and you should now continue to drive to, the, to your uh, specialist office like you used to. I think that there would be a lot of, I suspect that there would be a lot of, of anger <laughs> and upsetness given um, that this almost shock treatment um, and uptake, shock uptake of technologies across healthcare systems um, has demonstrated some very, some, some the effectiveness of some of these even very basic technology tools to improve the efficiency of healthcare delivery. And they'll have to address that through policy making rapidly, I think. So your data and your questions, uh, your the questions you want to raise, but your your data and your stories <laughs> are going to be um, absolutely essential. And they do beg a public debate, which I think will prop there's this thread will be pulled on, I expect numerous times today in the panels about the the healthcare sector being as highly regulated as it is as it is in comparison to other sectors, for good reason, but highly regulated. Um, do the panoply of laws and reg regulations that exist for our sector continue to serve the public interest that they were intended to serve when they were put in place today? Some laws and regulations can be a quarter of a century old. Do they need to be, and this isn't me saying, uh, Mr. Anti-Regulation, let's wipe it all away. By any means, I'm not saying that, but a revisitation, a consolidation, a re something, you know? I think is probably in order. And that debate is, 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 I think we're prompting that debate. We should prompt that debate and have that debate here today and, and, and elsewhere. And uh, likewise, do, do the same laws and regulations map to today's patient and clinician and caregiver expectations? Really interesting questions. And, uh, I am, every time I talk to somebody about this, I hear different opinions and it's really interesting. I always learn something. I expect to learn a lot today. So following, uh, once I once I stop talking here, <laughs> I think you're gonna see some excellent panels filled with um, ex with on the ground experience and, uh, and, and other experience that will give you the latest on digital health uh, and regulatory and payment changes, uh, ongoing challenges experiences and lessons learned from implementation so far, which is very key for us all to understand and, and iterate on. And then insights about where we might find ourselves at the end, and I, I should do air quotes again, <laughs> of this public health emergency. Uh, so I really look forward to the programming today. I really thank you all for, for listening to my thoughts and, and for being able to uh, uh, take part here. And, uh, and thank you again to the organizers and, and sponsors. Thanks, Brian. And I'll, I will now, we're, we're, we'll now turn it over to, to Carla Robinson for our panel on regulatory and payment issues. Carla? Terrific. Um, thank you very much, Rick. So this first panel is on telehealth regulatory and payment updates and challenges and safeguards for physicians and physician practices. We are delighted to be joined by three experts in these areas. Um, our panelists today are Courtney Tito. She's a member of McDonald Hopkins LLC and practices in its health law group in the West Palm Beach, Florida office. We are also joined by Ch Charles A. James Jr., um, who is president and CEO of North American Healthcare Management Services. He provides educational sessions and webinars on billing and compliance to organizations across the United States. And finally, we are joined by Emily Johnson, who is a member of McDonald Hopkins in the Chicago office, where she provides regulatory and compliance assistance in the healthcare industry on the federal and state level. Um, our first speaker um, will be Courtney Tito. Um, Ms. Tito counsels and represents clients in the health law industry, including federal and private payer audits and disputes, reimbursement matters, contracts, corporate, enrollment revocations, 
payment suspensions, internal investigations, compliance and regulatory matters, and responding to federal subpoenas and civil investigative demands. She advises clients in both federal and state matters um, on regulatory and compliance matters, including licensing, billing and reimbursement, corporate transactions, CLIA standards, state and federal fraud and abuse rules and regulations, and telehealth matters. She also advises clients regarding direct-to-consumer issues. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over um, to Courtney. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Carla. Um, I just want to say thank you all so much for having me here with you today. Um, as we have been discussing today, this area of telehealth during the public health emergency is a constantly evolving area. Um, we have two other fantastic speakers for this panel, so I want to make sure they have sufficient time to get through their remarks as well. Um, but I'd like to speak with you all today at a, a very high level um, and give a brief overview about some of the highlights of where the federal changes have occurred so far. Um, and then I'll provide throughout my presentation some best practice tips. And finally, I'm going to touch on enforcement considerations for during and after the public health crisis. Most of my comments today are focused on the changes implemented by CMS for the Medicare program but it's critically important for all providers to review and keep on top of all policies and guidance for all of their payers, both federal, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. Fortunately, of the commercial payers whose websites I've been reviewing during this pandemic, pandemic, most have centralized websites for these general policies that they've implemented related to COVID-19, and most appear to be frequently updating their guidance and policies. Um, for those of you who work with payers, you know, I feel like more and more recently um, they've been making it harder and harder for providers and counsel and consultants to get to these policies by putting them behind provider-only portals or other such um, methods of making it more difficult to find. So far, I have found most of the policies that I've been looking for related to the pandemic have been very easy to find and on general websites. Um, so for my first best practice tip, if you have the internal bandwidth within your practice, um, I would recommend that you assign someone to take ownership of these regulatory and payment updates. Whether you assign multiple people who you know, focus on certain issues or you have people who focus on certain payers, um, someone who will be responsible for making sure that your practice is kept up to date for the things that are important. If you don't have the capacity internally within your practice, then I strongly suggest that you reach out to your attorneys and or consultants to get their assistance, as I believe strict compliance remains critical for navigating through these changing regulations and policies. So on this first slide, I've listed the some of the areas where the federal government has made temporary, or at least for now, temporary changes to CMS's um, telehealth policies. Um, Charles is going to be going into a little bit more detail on some of these, um, but I just wanted to touch at a high level on these, these areas that are listed on the slide so that if you aren't already aware of the changes in these things, um, in these areas, you can have somebody look into them. You can reach out to us or to your consultants and attorneys and get the information that you need. Um, there has been information on clarifying and changing place of service codes. Um, so you'll need to understand what place of service codes you need to be using during the pandemic. Um, for the modifiers, CMS has issued guidance on the use of DR or disaster related and CR or catastrophe disaster related um, modifiers and also on the use of the modifier 95, which was for telemedicine. CMS has created a list of over 80 services that can be provided. And the last version I looked at that list um, really very clearly notated the temporary changes um, for what is available. Consent is required. And again, here's where my, my next best practice tip is. Although CMS says that this consent can be verbal, I strongly recommend getting some sort of written consent. Um, your attorney or a consultant can assist you in drafting a consent form that can be used and then work with you on how to best implement the process for your practice. Next, um, you can use either medical decision-making or time for document documenting these telehealth services. 
Um, CMS has expanded um, the types of providers that can do telehealth services. Uh, telehealth services are going to be paid at face-to-face -face rates. And they have also expanded the geography, so it's not just rural providers. Um, and finally, there's also expanded facility types. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, on this page, I've listed um, some of these areas, these virtual services, virtual check-ins, e-visits, telephone services, telemonitoring. These are areas where CMS is allowing um, expanded services. So they are removing limitations on geography and communication methods. Again, here they're expanding the, the types of authorized providers and they're relaxing enforcement in some of these areas. So these are important to keep on top of. Um, next, I want to turn briefly to some additional best practices for documentation and compliance. You can see that um, for the first bullet point on this slide, I mentioned this at the start of my presentation, that you really need to have someone who's going to stay on top of the changes and monitor them and take ownership of them. As difficult as that may be, um, given everything that's out there, all the different types of guidance, frequently asked questions, facts, website changes, it's really crucial to keep t on top of the regulatory developments, the waivers, the enforcement descriptions, and the policy changes for all of your payers. Medical necessity and the technical requirements for documentation are still required and must be followed for the most part. Um, remember, especially for Medicare, but in reality, at least in my experience, for all payers, everything is evidence-based. So if you don't document it, in your medical records, then it is likely that the payer is going to take the position that it didn't happen. So you need to make sure that you know the relevant policies when they change. You need to understand what that means in, in actual practice for your practice. And then you're going to need to follow the policies and guidance to the best of your ability. And a lot of times, it's not easy to figure out how to um, implement these changes. So if you're struggling with making sure that those changes get implemented or how to best do it, again, reach out to attorneys and consultants um, because we're seeing a lot of this and we can help. So on my next slide is um, enforcement considerations. All the relevant agencies and public officials have taken a really public stance on enforcement of everything COVID related. This applies, you know, not only to the pub, to the provider relief funds, but I believe it's also going to apply to, to claims reimbursement, where CMS has relaxed enforcement or temporarily changed how things done are done. Now, I think that the bar for establishing medical necessity for these services will likely be pretty low as far as, you know, making that argument to the government, but you're still going to need to document it. The government, as we all know, is spending billions with a B on the COVID-19 public health emergency all across the board. And I think it's clear from past um, enforcement efforts that healthcare fraud and abuse has been one of the most successful areas of enforcement for the federal government. I think one of the statistics I looked at, if, I, it's probably a few years at this point, a few years ago at this point, was when they claw back this money when they're doing enforcement, they end up taking in $7 for every dollar that they had originally reimbursed because of civil monetary um, penalties, trouble damages, and the like. So I think enforcement efforts are going to be extremely aggressive for every dime that is spent during this public health emergency. Secretary Azar has made public statements about enforcement. Um, HH, there are HHS facts, frequently asked questions out there that talk about how they are going to be doing everything in their power to monitor how the money is spent and how um, and how the providers are using it. And the OIG very recently came out with a strategic plan entitled Oversight of COVID-19 Response and Recovery. This is not a long document, maybe four or five pages. It has four goals. The goals are to protect people, protect funds, protect infrastructure, and promote effectiveness. And when I first was you know, reading through this, it struck me that protecting funds was the second goal right after protecting people. And I found that to be really interesting that it's very high on their, their list of protections. But when you actually get into the document, every single paragraph, talks about fraud enforcement, 
investigations, audits, guidance, deploying law enforcement personnel. So they are taking this very seriously. Um, and as they are doing in almost every sort of audit um, consideration that's going on now, they're using data analytics and it, so that they can identify and target potential fraud, waste, and abuse affecting the HHS program. They're also going to be using artificial intelligence to direct to detect uh, to detect trends and patterns of suspicious activity. Um, so, oftentimes somebody can sort of pop as an outlier on these data analytics for whatever reason, your patient population, um, whatever it is, whatever data points that the whatever agency it is or payer has put in there. We don't have control over the data points, so we don't know why somebody gets targeted in all instances. And it may be for very, you know, valid reasons. You know, your patient population is such that you have a very high number of, you know, rural party, rural beneficiaries. And that's why you are so much higher on the list of money that's being reimbursed than a similarly situated provider somewhere else. The goal here is to make sure that your documentation and the reports and the substance that you have to support how you spend any money or the reimbursements that you collect for these um, telehealth services is as close to perfect as possible so that you are not trying in the event of an audit to recreate those documents or to pull it together. You have it ready, you provide it to the agency, you provide it to the payer, and they move on. So I think it's really important to um, be cognizant of the fact that enforcement is coming and it's better to be prepared on the front end than on the back end. And then something that um, Brian mentioned, which I think is critically important, is you need to have a plan in place now for when the public health emergency is going to end. We don't know when that's going to be. And trying to transition out of that and making sure that your patients and your practice are prepared to transition out in the best way possible um, is going to be important. Now, we don't know what changes will be made, what will revert back to the original um, way of doing things, but it's important to have as much of a strategic plan for your own practice as possible um, now so that when you get to that point, you're not um, scrambling. So with that, I'd like to turn the program back to Carla or Charles, and uh, thank you again for having me here today. Terrific. Courtney, thank you so much. Um, and I will... Um, introduce uh, Charles James Jr., President and CEO of North American Healthcare Management Services. He um, is the current Vice President of the National Association of Rural Health Clinics and the President-Elect for the Illinois Rural Health Association. He's a longtime participant on the NAR NARHC Policy Committee and the National Rural Health Association Annual Policy Institutes. Um, Charles David James and Charles James Sr. started North American in 1992. North American provides comprehensive RCM, EHR hosting, provider enrollment, and other services to physicians, hospitals, RHCs, and FQHCs across the country. Charles, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for the kind introduction. I appreciate it, and, and it's a pleasure to be here with the panel of obviously highly qualified folks with a lot of technical detail on this. As you could tell from my description, I come from this from the rural health angle and the FQHC angle. Many of the folks on this call are likely not RHCs or FQHCs, but if you have had or if your providers perform telehealth services pre-emergency, your patients were likely sitting in one of those entities as the originating site. Part of the some of the comments I've heard talk about what's going to happen as we come out of the emergency, which is critical, critical, critical. Uh, but we also have to know what we look like going into the emergency. So from a rural health clinic perspective, tacking on to what Courtney said on the federal angle, we had some massive policy problems built in that turned out to be statutory, which means they were cooked into the law that created both telehealth services and RHCs and FQHCs. Many of you, FQHC is a federally qualified health center. 
and those can be urban, suburban, or rural. Of course, a rural health clinic is, by definition, rural. In addition to critical access hospitals and some other sites, RHCs, FQHCs, critical access hospitals are, by statute, so by law, originating sites. Patients could, so the originating site is where the patient sits in front of the camera, and our distant site is where the provider is sitting, looking at the image of the patient. So by statute, our RHCs and FQHCs could not be the place where the provider was on the telehealth platform. So we could not, going into the emergency, we had a massive problem that we couldn't see patients via telehealth by statute. I'm sure that many of us were glued to the television and the news at the beginning of the public health emergency, of course, in a different manner than we are glued to the television and news today for the, all of the, the mayhem happening. But at the beginning of the emergency, and I, for one, was watching very closely. I had just been to D.C. at the Policy Institute. Seema Verma, CMS administrator, got up there with President Trump, Secretary Asnar, et cetera, and were listing a series of exceptions and new policy provisions and waivers. And in those series of waivers, they did everything but waive what we needed for rural health clinics and FQHCs as an originating site. So we built in, we could not get paid for telehealth services and we cannot be paid, quote unquote, as if we're seeing the patient in our office, full payment for our services, as if the patient is in front of us. RHCs and FQHCs were not able to do that. So our provisions were vastly different than the rest of the world. And we spent many, many weeks, many weeks, trying to sort through that at the policy level for our rural providers. Of course, the import of telehealth services to our, to our rural health clinics, and our rural beneficiaries is dramatically important. While the policy provisions lagged behind, think about the nature of our rural constituents. Transportation security is a huge deal. It's very difficult for Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries to get a ride even across town sometimes, especially if they're not ambulatory, to get to the clinic, to sit in front of a camera and be seen by remote providers or by a rural health clinic FQHC providers. At the very outset of this, I was listening to uh, some anecdotes about the elderly woman who came with her her compromised husband to come to a primary care setting and receive the results of tests that were performed pre-emergency. So of course we can all predict. The tests were for cancer. The test came back. The patient had terminal cancer diagnosis and she had to come into the clinic to get that diagnosis in the middle of a pandemic. So we, we can see the shortcomings of those policy provisions. And given the, the, all of the hand wringing that our part of the industry did for those first few weeks of the emergency was brutal. And it really spoke to the administrative overload that we all experience in healthcare. Now, look, I'm a consultant. If things were simple, I'd be out of a job. But this has been a healthcare 9-11 that overnight had to change how we deliver healthcare services. And overnight, it became fundamental that we not only understand what we can do, but to Courtney's point, how we can legally be paid for it. So we were in a position to either have to commit fraud or not be paid for our services at a time when our industry was tanking. So if I could please have the next slide. So it took until, so all of the emergency waivers said any provider anywhere can see patients regardless of where they are, see patients in their home, except 
all of these exceptions that had to pan out. And of course, to list the exceptions took much more time than it did to announce the initial waiver. So it took federal legislation. CMS made the determination that they could not change this without statutory relief, i.e. change the law. So now we're in a position where if you all are providing telehealth services to patients, they no longer have to be in an originating site. And we've washed all of the distant site provisions. So now our providers can be, we can be in our rural health clinic or FQHC, and we can look at our, at our FaceTime image of our patient and we can conduct a telehealth visit, but we're still only receiving a partial payment for that. We're not getting full rates for that. We can be the originating and distant site, but only during the emergency. So to the previous speaker's point, this is crucial that this become the new normal, that we do not go back to a flawed pre-emergency status quo. The emergency has been horrible, and we've of course had a lot of uh, had significant loss of life. But we need to take away the positives of this, and in my view, increased implementation of telehealth is part of that key. If we could have the next slide, please. So the emergency waivers granted at the beginning did not apply to us, and the current distance site provisions only last as long as the public health emergency and there's no way to go back to that. So if we could go to the next slide, please. At the state level, the states got way out and this was actually happening pre-COVID emergency. The states were getting out in front of CMS. Normally, in a lot of ways, Medicare leads policy. But in this instance, the states and the commercial payers were opening this up to where at the state of Illinois, Again, during the emergency, um, I, can, I can't see my whole slide here, just with my panels here. So, so with dates of service on or after March 9, 2020, or until the public health emergency no longer exists, we can be paid the same rates for telehealth services as in-person methods. This is not the case at the federal level. So the emergency rules expanded, this was the other issue, is that our rural providers, whether or not we could use telephone only. Many of our patients don't have broadband. They don't have smartphones. They don't know how to FaceTime. So audio only became critical and now we have it, but only for the duration of the emergency. And if I could have one more slide, please. We've got to have future legislation. We must have future legislation. So right now is the time to prepare for the end of the public health emergency. I think most of us see that the public health emergency is gonna go through the end of this year, if not into the next. So that's unknowable, but we need to be lobbying now to make all of these changes to telehealth permanent and that we get all inclusive rates, our full payment at the RHC level, and that all providers can see these patients remotely, regardless of their practice. Think about the infection control, transportation security, and the big one big thing that our patients, and of course we have rural patients, a lot of poverty out there, and we could get a view. We see what their social and economic conditions are via telehealth, which we could not do before. So this is an enhancement, and we need to be preparing for the future, and our commercial payers, our IDPA, our Medicare all need to sync up. And this is what the conversation we need to be having now. So uh, thank you very much. Of course, we could all spend an hour on this topic and that would be excruciating for you all. But thank you for allowing me to participate and I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Terrific, Charles, thank you so much, um, both for your remarks as well as your advocacy, particularly um, with the rural providers. Um, and next, we will shift to uh, Emily Johnson in the time we have remaining. Emily is a member of McDonald Hopkins, where she provides regulatory and compliance assistance in the healthcare industry on the federal and state level. 
Um, Emily will be speaking today about privacy and security, where she has significant experience with HIPAA compliance, including drafting HIPAA policies and procedures, breach response and notification, drafting responses to investigations, and advising clients on proactive HIPAA compliance and breach prevention. Emily, thanks a bunch. Thanks so much, Carla. And I want to um, reiterate what Courtney and Charles said. Thank you so much to the organizers of this panel for including me with my esteemed colleagues here today. I know we're short on time, so I'm going to make this um, as brief as possible so that we have room for questions and we can move on to the next panel. Um, so under the COVID pandemic, there have been revisions to a lot of laws. Courtney and Charles hit on a lot of them. Um, of importance for telehealth is the changes that have been created for um, HIPAA compliance. So prior to the COVID pandemic, um, there were a lot of regulations in place that sort of um, deterred people from participating in telehealth because of the um, mechanisms that they had to use and the technology that had to be used in order to have a valid telehealth encounter. When COVID happened, everything went sideways and CMS or HHS and OCR recognized the value in telehealth services during this pandemic. And so on March 17th, they announced their enforcement discretion for telehealth remote communication during the emergency period. What's critical is that the flexibility and enforcement discretion afforded during this emergency period is similar to what Charles and Courtney touched on. It's exactly that. It's limited to the emergency period and providers have to be mindful of how and if telehealth practices will be accepted once the period has concluded. So in the March 17th guidance, um, OCR announced that it would waive potential HIPAA penalties against healthcare providers who treat patients in good faith through telehealth during the emergency period. It's important to note that this just applies to providers. It does not apply to the clearing houses or insurance companies. Um, it's just those who are actually involved in the provision of telehealth services um, and not, not anyone else. It's intended to enable providers to serve patients wherever they are during the emergency period and to enable providers to reach those who are most at risk. So elderly, those with pre-existing conditions, without actually making those folks come in for a visit and either exposing themselves or exposing others. Under the enforcement discretion, a provider can use any non-public facing remote communication product that's available for any reason. So even if the services are unrelated to COVID, you can use telehealth um, communication platforms to provide telehealth services. The key is that the communication must be um, non-public facing. So FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, uh, video chat, Google Hangouts, Zoom, Skype, all of those are permitted right now, even if those platforms are generally considered to be non-HIPAA compliant. Um, the discretion itself, the penalty waiver, only applies when the services are performed in good faith for any telehealth treatment or other diagnostic purpose. Um, it's worth noting that although the penalties are relaxed, there is a concern that the use of non-compliant technology increases the chance that protected health information could be disclosed to an unauthorized party. So the recommendation is always that whenever possible, HIPAA compliant technology should be used. Additionally, OCR um, has stated that it won't impose penalties against a covered healthcare provider for not having a business associate agreement in place with a video communication vendor. But the recommendation is that if you have time to, you should get one in place. Um, the BAA establishes each party's rights and responsibilities, and it also sets out a more compliant relationship for when the emergency period ends and a BAA becomes required. Um, on March 20th, a few days after announcing the enforcement discretion, OCR issued guidance on telehealth remote communications. Um, due to the limited time here, I'm not gonna get into the specifics, but the purpose of the, the FAQs was really to identify who's included and excluded from the enforcement discretion, when the discretion expires, where providers can conduct telehealth, and what is considered non-public facing technology. So in the interest of time, if we could go to the next slide, please. 
Okay, so permissible locations for telehealth. There are state specifics on this, so I don't wanna get into too much of the detail here, but for purposes of privacy and compliance with HIPAA, as well as state privacy laws, providers should always perform telehealth in a private location, such as their clinic office um, or some other office setting. Patients likewise should receive telehealth in a private location. If they aren't in a private location, providers should um, not provide these services absent the patient's consent or some sort of emergency circumstances. Um, so moving on to the next slide, I know we only have like two minutes left. Um, so with the uh, onset of the COVID virus, right, there have been um, a, there's been a huge insurgence and in privacy issues, um, phishing attacks, malware, ransomware, Cyber criminals, unfortunately, are entrepreneurs. They take advantage of an opportunity, and right now they have a fantastic opportunity because much of the world has gone virtual, and this is their time to, to um, you know, manipulate that system. So we are seeing a lot of phishing attacks, and I'll talk about why this is applicable in a second here. Um, but the goal is to give up for a user to give up their credentials by clicking on a link um, during the pandemic. We've seen Zoom communications. Skype communications get exploited by these cyber criminals, and they do this two ways. One is through a phishing attack, right? So an email user receives an email that appears to be an invitation, and when he or she clicks on the link to join the meeting, they're then redirected to a phishing page where the threat actor tries to get the user to give up their credentials. The other avenue is actual hacking and accessing of an unsecured group communications platform. So the takeaway here is always password protect your meeting. Um, and make sure that the line is clear and that nobody else is on the line. Otherwise, you do have security and privacy implications. Um, it's worth noting that even though there's enforcement discretion from HIPAA, you still have liability under state privacy laws. So you might get a quote unquote free pass right now from HIPAA. That's not necessarily the case in all 50 states. So keep that in mind. Um, and I know I'm out of time. So if you wanna just advance to the next slide, I can just wrap. So post-COVID, telehealth and HIPAA, not dissimilar to what Courtney and Charles talked about, you know, what HIPAA compliance is going to look like is still to be determined, right? I think it's guaranteed, or I know it's guaranteed, that OCR will reinstate penalties for non-compliance on a go-forward basis once the emergency period um, ends. So um, non-compliance with the privacy breach and security rules will be enforced. There might be additional guidance on HIPAA compliant communication platforms, though HHS has been hesitant in the past to embrace any particular vendor. Um, and then I always recommend keep an eye on state privacy laws. Um, these impact the provision of telehealth and they're always changing even more so than HIPAA. So it's important um, to allocate people to monitor those as well. I know that was fast, but I wanted to keep with the schedule. But thank you so much for having me, and I will send it back to Carla. Emily, terrific. And um, we are going to squeeze in one question here, and it actually is for you, Emily, so that's perfect. Um, a couple of questions came in around how do you get properly witnessed written consents when doing a telehealth visit? So that is a uh, great question. Um, there's state law specifics in each state on how and when you can get that um, that consent. There is flexibility under states. Obviously, the preference is always to get a, a written consent. Um, and I haven't seen any um, enforcement discretion on the consent itself um, expressly, but I would read into it that under the privacy rule, right, um, that's where, where that um, type of language appears, the requirement for those consents. And as long as you are, you know, documenting the need for the services, if you can't get the written consent, a verbal consent should be sufficient during the emergency period only. Great. Thank you for that. And um, I'd like to give a thank you to all of our panelists. Um, a lot of um, changes um, evolving very rapidly. Uh, so your comments are, are, are quite on point um, to help us navigate this very complex situation. Um, with that, I will turn it over to um, Rick uh, to keep us moving. Thank you, Carla. Uh, We've had we've had a lot of great insights already on uh, we've had some insights on big picture issues from Brian regarding opportunities and challenges for telehealth and now we've had explanations for 
uh, a lot of the uh, regulatory and payment issues re relating to the environment for telehealth, which now provides, um, as we've discussed, a lot of increased flexibility as well as challenges. And um, it brings up the need for safeguards, which uh, our prior panel spoke, spoke about a little bit. Um, as, as Nancy noted, I'll, I'll just repeat this, the, the, the panelists are not going to be taking live questions during the discussion, but, 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 but certainly if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to, email them, to email them at, at the address at the, the bottom of the um, you know, slides, and then we can, um, we, can, we, we can take a look at them and try, try to get back to you on those. Um, we're now going to be talking with uh, three physician leaders about some of the ways that physicians are using uh, telehealth, uh, as well as some, some challenges and opportunities. So we've got uh, um, our three panelists. Uh, um, we've got uh, um, Cambies Zora Ed, Zora Asatane is a, 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 a physician who's a, a subspecialized and a board certified in, in, in vascular medicine. Yeah, he's also board certified in, in internal medicine and, and hospital medicine. He's on the, the medical staffs of, uh, of, I believe it's four, four hospitals in the, the, north, the northern suburbs of Chicago, part of the, part of the, part of the North Shore system, also part of uh, North Shore Cardio, Cardiovascular uh, uh, Institute, and uh, um, Dr. Zora, Zora Acetane is also active with uh, the Illinois State Medical Society. I'll, 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 I'll turn it over to, to, Zora, to Dr. Zora, Zora Acetane yeah, to, to, to provide a brief discussion of, of his experiences with uh, telehealth, and then, and then we'll, we'll have some further discussions after that. Doctor? Thank you, Rick, uh, for the introduction. Uh, so, well, you know, uh, Rick asked me to, you know, to just uh, give a brief, you know, uh, overview of my experience. It's more a personal experience about the telehealth and, you know, what I experienced in the battlefield, you know, particularly in during the pandemic. But I'm just going to take you back, you know, to uh, where I was a resident and, uh, you know, I was a resident in the uh, a fairly underserved area of the Chicago city. And we were always, you know, having this idea that how we can provide the uh, deliver health or provide the service to the patient that they, they have hard time to come and see us, but they're not qualified to receive home health, how we can communicate with them. And always there is a question that, well, this is not going to be reimbursed. And that was, was one of the holders. Later on, then my practice focused in uh, strictly in the, in the critical care and, and inpatient care. Then I, I, I was, uh, you know, appreciating how we can, you know, utilize the telehealth in, in a critical care setting, but the responsibility of, you know, cost and, uh, you know, uh, issues was, you know, uh, taken by the health system in order to facilitate and deliver the care, but that was so limited. Later on, whenever we were start exploring and learning of what's going on outside the United States border about telehealth, and uh, we try to come up with some plan that we can implement, especially when I become a vascular medicine physician, which is the underserved sub specialty in medicine. Always we have the issue that this is not going to be reimbursed. And here you go, you're in a metropolitan area, big city, and this is you know excluded from potential sort of reimbursement. So basically, we were just having the idea in our mind, and that's it. So when uh, you know the, the, we uh, faced with this uh, uh, national and uh, for, you know world uh, you know uh, epidemic of, of COVID-19 virus, so one of the first things that came to my mind was how I'm going to take care of my patients, my COVID patient, non-COVID patient. So and uh, this idea starts you know um, sort of growing in the state society, and then we hear that okay, well there's some relief. At the moment there's some relief, we were looking for a solution. We were not mentally prepared for it. My, my, my take was to just start you using any platform that can connect me with a patient. What I learned throughout this experience, which I did talk about try and error, and um, in my you know, practice, I ended up using a WhatsApp application, not you know, in particular, I'm focusing on WhatsApp, but uh, what, uh, what it really started working for me was the simplest you know, application that I can use to connect with a patient. And it's easy, more importantly, it's easy for the patient to use it. 
So I found it so critical that whatever platform we use, it should be easy to use for the patient and friendly for the patient before even we think about all those things. But uh, we all know uh, we, we were able to move fast to utilize this, you know, uh, you know, part of medicine that kind of forgotten for years because the, the rules and regulations, you know, sort of, uh, you know, relief that we have. If, if we didn't have those, I don't know how long, you know, it was taking to get us to where we are right now. And the, the lesson that I personally learned is that these rules and regulations stopping us from delivering the care to the patient using the telehealth. And maybe it's a time to review the data we learned from the COVID and sort of revisit the view that we had in the past. If we move back to the same point with ignoring what we experienced, I think it would be challenging. And maybe we have to hope for another COVID, another pandemic to just, you know, get the attention from the top down to, you know, how uh, the telehealth can be useful. It's, the time is short. I'm not going to detail that we experience, but what I, I feel that we need to do as a practicing physician, maybe we can start utilizing it sometimes. With, with no reimbursement or less reimbursement or this, if the regulation allows, you know, we are offering it to the patient outside the insurances and, you know, uh, regulatory bodies and see if the patient accepts. If we can connect with the patient in their direction, maybe we can take them to, to follow up and, you know, sort of accept the telehealth as a part of, you know, uh, a patient, physician, patient provider, you know, uh, relationship. I think uh, I, I just conclude that this, you know, that's at this point, I know the time is short, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions that rise later. Thank you, Dr. Zora Acetane. Our next speaker on our on this panel is going to be Charlotte Wu, MD. Uh, uh, Dr. Wu was founder and principal of Harness Health Partners. Prior to that, she was uh, director of adult primary care at Boston Medical Center and also assistant professor at uh, Boston Boston University School of Medicine. Dr. Wu? Thank you so much, Rick, and thank you so much for including me on this panel. The other speakers have covered some very important points already, including in the regulatory, privacy, and security areas. So just to add to these perspectives, I'll just highlight some general insights and themes based on my multiple connections to telehealth in the last decade through delivering telehealth myself as a provider, advising and working with telehealth and digital health companies, and also implementing digital health technologies at Boston Medical Center, which is the large safety net practice uh, and I had over 150 physicians under me, so we were navigating that. Um, and lastly, I'll highlight um, some tools that you might find useful that I helped to develop through uh, the American Medical Association. So first in context, I, I am highlighting again what other people have talked to about, which is this is such a unique time for telehealth. And as we heard from Brian in our keynote, many capabilities have been unlocked. So to give some numbers to it, uh, a recent survey of more than 1,300 physicians by healthcare research organization CERNO last month showed that 90% of US physicians are using telehealth now and focusing on primary care, which is my area, um, another survey by Bain Consulting found that 97% of PCP surveyed were using telehealth. And interesting in the breakdown that only 24% were related to COVID and the rest were patient follow-up visits, about 36%, urgent care, 27%, because of course, the rest of our health issues don't go away. So I think that's important to think about as we think about how we come out of the crisis. So I think this adoption is a huge opportunity because in my experience, change management is often one of the biggest barriers and for better, for worse, COVID overcame this. And so I see the next important step is really to move from this necessity driven use of telecommunication tools uh, to implementing true telemedicine models. So I think we need to one, consider all the multiple users and stakeholders, and then two, we need to embed it into our workflows in an intentional way, not sort of an emergency response uh, way. So in the health systems that I worked with recently, many have 
more than five or more technologies being used from the doctors on the ground. So as we heard about WhatsApp, Zoom, FaceTime, anything that you can reach for to take care of patients. But of course, this will have to be whittled down and institutionalized. And again, we have to think that there are different devices being used and different modalities, right? Not just the video conference, what do we do and how do we think about remote patient monitoring? And so I think when looked at from this broader perspective, we're really reimagining a system of care. Um, and from my personal experience, I'll just say, practicing telehealth really is, has been an expanded skill set to the art of medicine. I found that it's been a worry uh, by some people, but that I have been able to build rapport with patients, even new patients in urgent care visits through especially the video chats. And this has been reflected by very positive patient feedback. Um, there's a growing literature, which I think should be continued to be emphasized, where teaching and sharing ways to communicate effectively, how do we express empathy in a telehealth visit is really important. Uh, so one example I'll give, you can't see me here on video, but it, it turns out I happen to use my hands a lot when I'm talking. And this is something that I realize if you put it in a place up further where you where a patient can see on a video screen, it's one way that you can show engagement. And another important area where you don't realize until you do it is that you know you can't see them in person. So there's a whole new skill set of physical exam skills that you know how do you tell them to uh, direct their uh, sort of throat, uh, for instance, uh, do a camera on a on a computer or on a phone so that you can see their throat. This is something I hadn't had to do before, but once you learn, you're able to have a script around that. So I think that's important. And, um, and then I think the other thing I would emphasize is there's it's really important to have a robust implementation plan and, and that the technology is just a tool. So the tool really is to support people, teams, and workflows, and I think is an opportunity to take a deeper dive to engage uh, these team members to map out processes and brainstorm opportunities for improvement, which then can include the telehealth. So I will, when we talk uh, perhaps about best practices, I can highlight a more um, what uh, you might be able to find in the American Medical Association Telehealth Implementation Playbook. Uh, but I'll say lastly that I think it's very important to partner with patients and think of all the users of the technology um, because I think uh, some of our prior experiences with us, other technologies such as, such as EHRs might have been challenging. And so we need to make sure with telehealth, we're creating good user experience and we're communicating between all the users. It's interoperable and it presents just the information needed by each person, not sort of all that data. You know, for instance, every Fitbit uh, piece of information from the last month, that's quite overwhelming. But how can we channel in a way where the, the patient can take an action and the doctor can make a management decision. So thank you for having me again. And in summary, I think we're coming to an important junction we've, we've all been mentioning. And I think in, in addition to the regulatory plans, um, we can talk more about what, what you can think about in terms of implementation. And I look forward to exploring this further in our discussion. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Our uh, next speaker is gonna be Eric Johnson. Um, Dr. Johnson is, is, is Associate Professor at University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Uh, he's also Assistant Medical Director of the Diabetes Center at uh, All True Health Center, and he's in a number some other positions as well. But I'll uh, turn it over to, um, to Dr. Johnson. Well, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for including me today. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I am Dr. Eric Johnson. Um, I am at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences, and we are a community-based medical school. So most of our faculty and students and residents are scattered across North Dakota at a variety of different health settings uh, for practices and training, and I'm no exception to that. I've been the assistant medical director of the Diabetes Center at a small regional healthcare system called Altru Health System in Northeast North Dakota uh, since 1992, and I helped co-found the Diabetes Center there in 1998. I do have some extra slides, so uh, can you go ahead and advance to the next one? 
My practice setting is in a service area of about 250,000 extending from North Central North Dakota to North Central Minnesota. And as you might expect, this is a very rural area. And for a good part of the year, we have really variable weather to be charitable. Uh, we do have a full service team-based diabetes center and a number of those services are delivered uh, via telehealth in some different uh, modes. In my own practice, I'm about 30% clinic time. I'm about 70% administrative and teaching time. My entire clinic practice is diabetes care. And I see many type one patients using technology, including pumps, continuous glucose monitors and phone apps. So before we started doing telehealth services, we were doing a lot of data digital delivery uh, through a variety of uh, platforms. Prior to the COVID-19 outbreak in our system, about 30% of my visits were actually scheduled telemedicine visits, and I had been doing that for about seven years. But in a matter of three days, we switched all of my clinic visits, 100% of them to telehealth visits. I still do the traditional telemedicine visit, facility to facility, uh, but we're doing a lot more virtual visits, which are often device to device, and I will talk a little bit more about that. Our main base for our rurally based uh, telemedicine is at a clinic in Rugby, North Dakota, uh, the heart of America Medical Center, which is about 150 miles west of us. Uh, I live on the Minnesota border, so we do have a number of North Dakota and Minnesota patients. Some patients will drive 100 to 150 miles to get to Rugby from Western North Dakota to be seen at that site. So distance is a huge factor in our practice. And in our clinic system, we did about 13,000 virtual visits last year over about 20 different specialties. Uh, I expect that that number will be largely increased for 2020. We manage a lot of digital information from continuous glucose monitors that is often emailed to us or uploaded to third-party websites, which are then available to certified diabetes educators and or myself. And as I said, uh, I've been doing telemedicine visits for about seven years. Next slide, please. Post-COVID outbreak, as I said, we uh, really did a big flip in a matter of about three days. We're still doing the classic facility to facility telemedicine visit like you might see on the right, but we're doing a lot more virtual visits device to device. And uh, as has been noted by previous speakers, privacy is a very important piece. Uh, the, we usually require that the patients be at home uh, in a private area where we can talk to them easily. And uh, I have been doing these primarily from my own home in an office area that's very private uh, within my own house. Uh, so this was a huge switch for us right away. But in some ways we were ready for it and we were just able to gear up to see more patients in this fashion. A lot of it was really helping patients understand the software. We use a uh, closed secure system called Video and uh, that ac actually works very well. We're not using FaceTime, Skype or Zoom uh, presently for any of these diabetes care visits. Kind of a wrinkle on this is I'm a high risk person myself as a patient. So doing these from home has also been a very safe approach for me. Uh, so there's been some real interesting things that have gone on with this. With respect to what we've done administratively, uh, I've worked very close with legal and with coding and billing as well as my division leader uh, to make sure that we're doing this appropriately, seeing the appropriate patients and doing the appropriate coding and billing. We can flip to the next slide. I think one of the interesting things about a diabetes clinic in this particular issue is uh, persons with diabetes are known to be a high risk group. And many of these patients did not want to come into the clinic to be seen. So patient acceptance for these video visits was nearly universal almost immediately. Uh, the relaxation and modification of billing and coding that's been well described already has really made this a, a viable choice for us. A really fortunate thing for us was the state of Minnesota uh, relaxed their licensure rules to the degree that North Dakota providers 
could see patients via telehealth without a Minnesota license if the patient was in Minnesota, but we do have to do special tracking of those visits. I predict that patients are going to come to accept this as a regular part of their care. I think ultimately we will go to some kind of blend where we have some visits as virtual or telemedicine, uh, traditional telemedicine and some visits in the office. Um, but given our geographic issues, our weather issues, I just can't imagine us ever going back to normal. And I think that we will be advocating hard to retain these types of services going forward, even after the crisis is over, whenever that is. There are some elements that still need to be done in person. I can't do a comprehensive diabetic foot exam over the phone, um, but getting some patients in for some of their visits in-house would be helpful. At the rugby site, uh, usually the physician assistant or the primary care physician does the foot exam there, so I don't need to do it. And uh, we can probably work out something like that internally here as well, but we'll see. But I do think it will be some kind of blend of virtual and in person. And I believe those are all of my slides, are they, Rick? Oh, I did want to mention telehealth learning. Yes, I am an educator. Our students and residents have been thrust into telehealth environments very quickly. We had uh, previously already been doing some telehealth teaching with an AMA grant for a project we call Robots, uh, but we do spend a lot of time on what creates a quality visit. Uh, most of the things I learned about delivering a quality telehealth visit go back to when I was actually in a broadcasting program in college many years ago. And there are some things that we need to do to make sure that we can connect with patients uh, through a visit and uh, help them uh, be able to feel like they're connecting with us as well. And I believe that is all I have. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Um, so we've 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 heard a lot of a lot of uh, some great ob ob observations here about and, and kind of insights on telehealth health, telehealth is being used. Um, one thing I'm 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 interested in is to kind of get a little bit, and you, you've touched on this a little bit, but I'm, I'm interested in getting a little bit of follow-up on what each of you see as uh, uh, the keys to successfully and appropriately using telehealth. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Wu, do you, do, do you want to start? I, I, I know you mentioned that the AMA playbooks and some best practices, and you also had some, some observations too. Sure, uh, thank you. And in fact, if you wanted to go a couple slides back, I did include a couple of slides about the AMA telehealth implementation playbook that might be helpful for some of the people here on the call today. So I would say sort of drawing from my experience in the past, as I mentioned, I think some of the, the hardest parts are less about the technology, but more about how do you go through the details of implementation. And that involves everything from um, sort of figuring out what you're trying to do, getting people on board with the vision, and then all the details about getting all your stakeholders engaged, and then going through the implementation process. So um, I was part of an initiative uh, with the American Medical Association through a committee I'm on, which is very relevant to what we're talking about um, as it focuses on practice sustainability and also professional satisfaction. And um, in the spirit of finding out when we talk to a lot of practices across the country that the implementation was a big challenge, we put together two implementation playbooks. So. Um, one is highlighted here, and then I included the link for the second. The first here is on telehealth implementation. In fact, this was already created prior to COVID-19, so uh, we had it ready at a good time. And then the one that was pr uh, produced first is actually on remote patient monitoring, which I think is a very synergistic um, aspect of digital health, too, um, sort of what we think about often when we think about telehealth communication. So there are eight steps which are sort of described in detail. And if you go to the next slide, uh, the first four really look at some of the preparation steps. 
So everything from how do you make sure that you understand what the problem is and that the telehealth is being used to serve a need and not just is that the technology is driving what you're doing. So I think that is an important point. And there are different steps within that that help uh, help different health systems think about how do you think through the pain points and opportunities from patients and staff perspectives and then think about how which ones telehealth can help with and then how do you prioritize what are the first um, use cases that you can start with before you expand. So for instance, some sometimes we've started with, for instance, we've heard about uh, you know di chronic chronic disease such as diabetes, or is it going to be for those who are homebound or post hospitalizations? But that's really helped us sort of hone down where we're going to pilot before we spread. And then I think through some of these other steps, there are additional uh, there are additional checklists and other worksheets that help thinking about how do you, for instance, evaluate vendors. So earlier when we were talking about the regulatory situation, there's uh, I think a big thing that we've all talked about is how do you plan for post COVID-19, in which case we do need to think about are there vendors who are HIPAA compliant, for instance, you do want to start developing partnerships with. So for instance, in this section here, there is an example sort of partnership information form and things to help health systems again think through this. And I would say another thing to highlight is um, sort of very mindful that there's a whole variety of practices. So everything from small practices, that's one one doctor, two doctors, up to larger health systems. And, and the hope is that something like this playbook can be helpful for smaller practices who might not have the resources of a large health system. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I'll just say that the second half of the six steps really go into more detail in terms of workflows. I mentioned process mapping, again, being a really important point where uh, you work with your team members to go through and map out the processes. And in that, in that way of uh, mapping out the process, it's a way to also engage these champions who will be really crucial when you're trying to implement, to communicate and support different staff members. And also I think another big area that is important is how do you evaluate? So how are you gathering the data, how you evaluate it, and how you're iterating on what you're doing? And again, I think this will be really important. As we've talked about, the stories will be really important. So how do we show, for instance, regulators and others that this is, for instance, delivering quality patient care and also uh, providing access and um, saving money? So I think, um, so I think these are some, I guess, highlight some best practices, areas to think about, because again, this is new for many people. So I just wanted to highlight this uh, resource and happy to talk more in depth about any of these points. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Zora Acetane, do you, do you have any particular thoughts in terms of kind of some, some of the keys to success? Well, uh, you know, one of the things that I think uh, we need now when you're utilizing it in a broader, you know, uh, uh, you know, a uh, you know, broader field, you know, and you're utilizing the uh, telehealth, you know, for different disciplines of medicine, I think we just need to remind ourselves that, you know, our intention is first to do not harm. And this may be defined in, you know, a scope of practice for uh, delivering uh, either care or utilizing the telehealth and different discipline, uh, it's different. So uh, vascular physicians, so utilizing the telehealth, you know, it, it should pay attention to, uh, you know, the scope of practice way different view uh, from a dermatologist or a diabetic specialty. So I think this requires that each discipline come up with a plan that is acceptable and there's a consensus in that discipline that well, how, how are we going to define the scope of telehealth? And the reason is that, you know, definitely telehealth has limitations and we shouldn't forget about that. And that may result in harm or, you know, not providing the optimal care to the patient if we think that we can just broadly use it and that can, you know, be satisfactory in every discipline. I'll give you an example. So as a, a vascular physician seeing a patient, so um, checking a patient pulses cannot be delivered by telehealth. To the, to, you know, with the quality that you can actually utilize it at the bedside. So, and depend to the patient clinical setting, that would be crucial. So, 
it's recognizing this limitation, I think would be the first point. As I said, you know, we are going to like first speak without do not harm, you know, um, a, you know, rules. Just there, we need to define these lines, which is discipline in medicine. And uh, the other thing is that we have to begin to think about patients. There are patients out there that, uh, you know, they may not be receptive to a telehealth. We have to be prepared for that. We have to have acceptance that those patients should be served differently. So although they may become a telehealth friendly patient down the road or maybe near future, but we should have a system in place that they can get an equal, you know, uh, service compared to those that open to the health telehealth, you know, uh, service. I think this is more, uh, you know, it's part of the ethics of medicine that we need to work on it. And I feel it's very different from one discipline to the other discipline of medicine. Good. Dr. Johnson, any, any additional thoughts on kind of keys to success? I think we have heard that uh, being sure that we're seeing the right patient with the right modality is very important. And I think we're still trying to sort through that right now. There are clearly some more complex patients, perhaps with more end stage uh, types of diseases that maybe would not be ideally served by a virtual visit in their home. And uh, some patients absolutely need to come to the clinic uh, to be seen. We're flipping those a little bit too though. Uh, typically when I was doing classic telemedicine visits, for all uh, at the rugby site, I would come into the clinic and see them in their clinic in rugby. And at the site, we had extension tools like electronic stethoscope, uh, et cetera. So we could do a fairly thorough evaluation. But uh, now I'm doing some of those where the patient comes into the clinic in our town and at home, I am seeing them through video. So that's a little bit of a different type of visit too. So I. I think it's matching the right visit to the right patient, and they probably can't all do 100% of the same type of visit all the time. But we haven't really sorted that out yet, but I think that's where we're going. Good, and Dr. Johnson, we, we've, we, di we did get a question on uh, uh, your presentation, so I'll, I'll just uh, uh, you know, present it briefly. So the question is, so patients who cross over for traditional medical services in in, uh, in in your area, in your state, how do you handle the transition to telemedicine? Um, uh, and then a related question is, is like whether, do, do, you know, do all the physicians, everybody in your system have the multiple state licenses? You, you, I think you've kind of addressed this a little bit with the Minnesota, North Dakota issues. Yeah. Kind of a two-part question. Yeah, the um, the first part, um, I, I think I just sort of answered that is I think we're still trying to figure out what type of visit is ideal for the, a different type of patient and uh, reaching out across the border into Minnesota. Of course, we could see Minnesota patients before in our North Dakota offices with just a North Dakota license, but now a lot of these Minnesota patients wanna stay home and be seen on video visits and uh, we were unable to do that. I was unable to do that as I did not have a Minnesota license. Uh, they have relaxed those rules uh, to include a waiver, but we have to track all the patients that we see who are in Minnesota at the time of their visit, uh, which is a little bit different than what we would have normally been doing before. Um, how long they will continue to do that, I don't know. I don't know if it's just a crisis uh, mode thing or if this is something that will be permanent. That's been one of the real challenges with telehealth is uh, right now, quite often you need to be licensed in multiple states because you have to have a license where the patient is. Although some states have compacts uh, where you can have one license that's uh, universal for those settings. Uh, but I think that needs to be straightened out on a national level. Good, good. Um, what about uh, um, um, some of you touched on this a, 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 a little bit? Is kind of different different skill sets for uh, telehealth. I think Dr. Wu mentioned one. Do you do you have any other thoughts on uh, kind of how the how the the physician skills uh, vary based on whether the 
whether a particular uh, 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 visit is, is telehealth or whether it's in person? Yes, yeah, so this is a really good point, and I think goes to some of the, we'll say, areas that we need to continue focusing on um, for telehealth, which is that uh, that we need to think about how do we provide high quality care through telehealth. And because, again, it's grown so quickly, um, and many of us have not done this for decades and decades. Um, it is an area where we're all learning. And so this is, so again, this is an area I know that is just emerging right now, uh, but I think there, uh, there's more that's being done in terms of how we can thoughtfully triage, again, sort of what, what would be well served by a telehealth for, visit versus not and how to manage expectations. So again, a lot of that does, I think in, um, uh, in practices I've worked with who are further ahead, you know, they, they literally do training sessions as we do for in-person, right? But, uh, but we hadn't learned this in our typical sort of physical exam skills or history taking skills. So new, for instance, continuous medical education modules on how to do telehealth scripts for us to practice how we would start the visit so that we're managing expectations. Um, and then I think the other thing that, uh, that there's a lot of work on is um, how do we close the loop on recommendations as we move from urgent care, so just for instance, okay, taking care of that one rash or uh, the one urinary tract infection to how do we do longitudinal care well? Uh, so I think that there's a lot of work being done in terms of these areas, um, which I think is sort of moving from, again, um, sort of starting with, let's just have this as a stopgap measure to, okay, how do we proactively think about this as a plan of care, in which case that we need to really think about how do we prepare and make sure that this visit is, if not just as good, but even better in some instances, because maybe we can leverage information about exactly what's been happening with our patient um, day to day at home. So I think that's one of the benefits is that um, is that we can leverage that data. So I think that uh, I think there's a lot being done on that, and I and I know that. Uh, Dr. Eric Johnson mentioned it, but I do think that the link with education and how it's going to change our training, not just for trainees, but experienced doctors, is incredibly important as we move forward. Good, good. Any other thoughts on, on the, uh, that issue of different skill sets? So um, uh, I'm going to add uh, something that I think, you know, soon uh, or, you know, in the near future, we're going to have a data coming out of experience that, you know, uh, a telehealth, you know, uh, services, you know, uh, produced, uh, you know, during the COVID-19. I think the interpretation of these data also should be, uh, you know, because uh, positive that comes out of it, I think it's, uh, sometimes it should be specific to the, uh, to the situation. And then if the challenge is a negative comes out, so we have to make sure that that was the absolute emergency situation that, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the service delivered. So we would have some data, but I mean, the bottom line, the data that we gather from these, uh, you know, experience for about the two to three months, you know, for now will, will help us, you know, sort of, you know, navigate our future. And, uh, and, you know, implement the, you know, system that we can utilize the telehealth more and not only in the rural area, but in the metropolitan area, sometimes, you know, uh, having the telehealth, you know, in place in, in, in the, in, in the Chicago traffic is going to be, you know, as uh, facilitating as, as, uh, as, you know, having it, you know, defenses in rural area. So, well, I look forward, you know, to see the data that's produced, especially you know, inside the United States, you know, with experience that we have with the telehealth during this, you know, uh, emergency situation. Thank you. Rick, Thank you. Rick could I yeah. add one more? Sure. Question, and um, I just wanted to say an additional word to say, I think a lot of what we've been talking about is that because we haven't been able to uh, sort of go to 
say, brick and mortar clinics and hospitals in the same way. We're thinking about how telehealth can take the place of sort of normal care. And what I would say is um, to go beyond, it's actually very exciting to think about not just um, doing our normal care, but virtually, but how do we leverage and reimagine how this could go beyond and better? So I was thinking, you know, in terms of how, say, we're, we're doing a patient visit beyond what we normally can do in the in-person visit. Well, now, say, there's a patient that for some reason, their, say, their heart disease or their heart failure, diabetes hasn't been controlled, and I didn't understand. Well, now I can, you know, sort of do what I could have done in a home visit, but scan around the room, understand what they're doing with their medication taking, can understand, you know, some of their daily habits, right? We can know what they're doing at home physio or activity. We could you know, leverage what's going on with all of the technology that's happening in the home, for instance. So I guess I would also sort of have everyone think also on the positives and even beyond further to what we're using right now. Um, and I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities there as well. Good. Thanks. Thanks. One one thing I'm kind of kind of kind of curious about is, uh, yeah, in in recent years there's been a lot of uh, yeah, dismay and concern about physicians not having enough time with patients that they uh, uh, just yeah yeah they're, yeah they're expected to see the patient and and not spend time. Do you do you have any thoughts as to whether does telehealth help in that regard? Is it going to give allow physicians to maybe fit more into the the, the discussions or or does it have an impact there? Uh, I can, you know, uh, speak to my experience, you know, about this. Uh, I think yes or no, uh, as long as there is a system in place that can prepare the patient for using the technology, I think it adds to our, you know, time that we can spend with the patient. And the basic transportation, uh, you know, in, inside the, uh, the medical facility usually, you know, uh, takes time from the potential time that we can use for a visit. Uh, overall, my personal experience was with a telehealth, I can spend more time for my patient. So it's a more dedicated time and, uh, and I can, you know, uh, have more time during the encounter just face to face with a patient. Uh, and I think, uh, well, probably data is going to show that, you know, because I, it, I didn't see uh, you know, the, this, unless the patient is not able to, you know, utilize the technology and we have to spend time to help the patient using the technology or system that we're using. Other than that, I think it's going to increase their, you know, face-to-face -face time and patient time, patient physician time overall. I, uh, agree. I agree ahead, with that. Ahead. I agree with that. And I would just say that I'm a firm believer that um, when adopted well and right that uh and the right technology as i said sort of that's driven by the issues and the people and the processes i think that technology broadly can really bring back more time and relationships and connections to medicine which is what brought many of us to the profession in the first place which has been a big challenge and has you know, sort of burnout and resilience has been an issue. And so especially technologies that, again, allow us to do less things that were not relationship driven. So for instance, things that involve uh, sort of going through data, entering, sort of waiting on the lines to, you know, sort of make a referral, um, looking through a lot of data that, uh, again, we could not do in a quick way, Underst understanding what's happening at all the time that patients at home in between so we can do better and spend that time on education. So I think, again, I think when adopted well and thoughtfully chosen, I do think that it can bring more time and better relationships. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I just want to add one more thing that uh, that was my today experience. I, and I, uh, one more, uh, you know, benefit is that we can be more flexible. So I feel this flexibility, uh, uh, not to the not to the extent to be disorganized. But for example, today uh, I supposed to have a cancel 
you know, clinic between 12 to 2 because of this webinar. And uh, one of our patients at 1 o'clock was so scheduled and didn't, they didn't cancel it. There was a, some, you know, miscommunication with the administrative part and, you know, clinical part of the clinic. Then we called the patient and said, I, well, probably I'm going to call, call him after the clinic at time. And it, 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 it went very well. I mean, we noticed about that, like about hours to the a webinar was it was a telehealth visit and, and patients you know accepted it was much easier to just move things around and you know sort of be flexible than if it was an in-person visit i don't know if this patient probably would have left the house by the time we called the patient so that would be another point that i think is a positive point about utilizing the telehealth good good these are these are these are all great great points i love um, Lots of uh, uh, insights and observations. So our our last panel of the day. So uh, yeah, is going to uh, yeah we've got two speakers who are going to address kind of the possibilities post post COVID. How to uh, uh, yeah prepare that tel telehealth in the post COVID area. So we've got we've got two two speakers here. We've got Clifford Clifford Daxo. Uh, yeah, MD is a professor at uh, uh, Baylor College of Medicine and adjunct also adjunct professor of electrical and computer engineering at Rice University. Um, and since, since, we're, since we're a little bit short on, on time, I'm, I'm going to keep the introductions kind of very short. And our, 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 our other speaker on our, on our last panel here is Bob Teague. Bob is uh, chief medical officer for, for Green Room Technologies. He specializes in business, market, and technology readiness for uh, health tech companies with medical devices and uh, software products. Bob's also board certified in internal medicine. Cliff and Bob. Thank you very much, Rick. Um, let me just uh, let, get my next slide up, please. Thank you. So to carry on with the theme that's been uh, predominant throughout this meeting to let you know that uh, what we've done now in terms of preparation in the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic pandemic is only the first. And there are many, many more pathogenic viruses waiting out there uh, to greet our airways. Here's a Time magazine from uh, several years ago talking about how we are not ready for the next pandemic. There's an article by uh, Tony Fauci in Journal of Infectious Disease in 2007, essentially saying the same thing. And so we can expect to see not only SARS-CoV-2, but also its cousins and uh, other distant relatives for quite a while to come. And we need to prepare our systems of healthcare, not only telehealth and telemedicine, we have to prepare our systems of healthcare to be ready for it. So next slide, please. The old uh, world uh, is uh, not all that long ago. Uh, I found this uh, in the archives of uh, the internet. Uh, who knew that there was such a thing? Uh, from uh, roughly 20 years ago, where Red Duke at the University of Texas, a then famous cowboy physician, emergency doctor, uh, went to a private concern and said, let's set up a telemedicine company so people can. Uh, type in their symptoms, and it'll tell them exactly what to do and when to do it. The problem with this algorithm is that uh, every time that you put an input into it, the final common pathway was always, well, then you have to go to the emergency room. And so telehealth uh, in that context died a, a merciful death. However, in rural areas in Texas and many other uh, parts of the country, telemedicine hung on. Uh, using relatively rudimentary technology, but in places like um, the University of Texas in Galveston, where they've been using telehealth for the Texas state prison system for at least 20 years, it has become boiled in and baked into the system of care. Next slide, please. So let's look at telehealth uh, in a short period of time from now. Let's just say a year and a half to two. From the patient's point of view, telehealth will be very convenient. Uh, it, it will require, people have talked about the compute, commuting in the rural areas. Commuting in the urban areas is a similar problem. 
paying twenty dollars to park at a medical center, sitting in a crowded waiting room, having to get dressed from the uh, uh, including from the waist down. Uh, all these inconveniences can be circumvented by telehealth. The stress of the clinical environment for many of my patients, and I know uh, for, for others, uh, is not inconsequential. And that, of course, gets avoided. People do well uh, in, the, in the privacy of their own home. And one would even imagine that diseases such as white coat hypertension uh, may go away because patients don't have to sit in the clinical environment. Uh, the decrease in exposure to contagion cannot be uh, overemphasized. Uh, I know for a fact that my patients are, for many of them, are uh, very uh, loath to come to the clinical setting right now, uh, not only because of uh, SARS-CoV-2, but also uh, other conditions that they might contract. And the ability to not come into that area is good. I talked about the dressing part. And then uh, the uh, what I call the Jiffy Lube aspiration, which is the aspiration on the part of people to get the service that they need for the part that they need serviced. Uh, no more, no less. You go into Jiffy Lube, uh, you need to get your oil changed, you get your oil changed. I go into the doctor, I need to get my sore throat taken care of, I get my sore throat taken care of. And people are looking at telehealth as a way to get that done. From the clinician's point of view, however, uh, and Dr. both Dr. Johnson and Dr. Wu addressed this, is the limitation of the data availability and particularly with regard to the clinical exam, where we are forced to rely on two of our five senses, and maybe even our sixth sense of intuition uh, is blocked as well. Uh, there's a clear increased risk of missing something. Uh, and uh, we who practice clinical medicine live in fear of that. We talked about privacy already. We already talked about payment uncertainty. Um, we talked about, for the, from the clinician's point of view, maybe the uh, decrease in the necessity of maintaining large office space. And from the clinician's view is also the Jiffy Lube problem. That is the ability <clears throat> to expand the visit beyond simple, the chief complaint that the patient came to. Let me have the next slide, please. So what are the questions on my list to uh, address for the future? some of which Bob will take care of in the next few minutes. One is we have to define a telehealth list, uh, telehealth visit. We've been dancing around that question for the last hour and a half, the confusion between telemedicine, telehealth, uh, et cetera, teledermatology, telepathology, telepsychiatry. We have to define what is a telehealth visit that will determine how the clinicians <laughs> behave, how the patients behave, and how they'll be paid. We're going to have to decide how to manage that gap of data and how to man manage pressure for increased utilization of ancillaries to make up for the fact that we can't do a physical exam, we can't see the entire patient, we can't see how uh, he or she comports himself. Uh, there's going to be a large data gap which we're going to have to manage, and I'm, my fear is that we're going to fill that with CT scans, which will not necessarily be in the patient's interest. Uh, we'll have to address the issue of how do we uh, differentiate between a new patient and an established patient in terms of our getting our database. And then, as I mentioned before, the multiple medical problems issue. I believe that this pie chart represents what we'll be able to do in the future, which is about 70% of visits will be amenable, at least in part, to telehealth, whereas about 30% will certainly not. I had a patient just uh, while we were on this call uh, send a text asking for a telehealth visit for abdominal pain. And I can assure you that I have a certain amount of trepidation about doing that. Um, so let me turn this over to uh, my friend and colleague, Bob Teague, to uh, wrap it up. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Cliff. Um, and uh, thank you for everybody who stayed uh, to hear the last speaker. That's always uh, uh, appreciated. So. I want to talk a little bit about telehealth future directions, um, some of which is technologically related. So while we've had the technology available in its basic form to do telemedicine for multiple decades, it's still not quite where it needs to be, as we've heard multiple times already. <clears throat> so um, uh, one of the things that we're interested in is following uh, advances in these four main domains of uh, technology development and connectivity, computing, robotics, and automation. Uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, while, while the ability to do a telehealth visit has been around for a long time, the acceptance by the profession and patients has been relatively slow to occur until the last two months. And so whatever the number is, it went from a small number to a big number. Uh, some of the issues around the barriers for acceptance were loosened up, but not taken away. And through the years, for those of us who have done implementations over and over, uh, <clears throat> there are really four main areas where, um, where there have been barriers that have slowed the implementation of, of telehealth. And, and I listed them here, who pays? So the issues of payment, particularly in fee-for-service world, uh, were a major barrier to adoption. Um, whose license are we going to use? Who's got the liability? Who's got the right to see the patient? And all those things that we've already heard about. Who answers refers to what is the workflow? And I always used to say earlier that if I could call a specialist on the phone to get a telehealth consult in real time, how come I can get them on the phone? Why aren't they busier? So uh, I think workflow issues uh, are still problems, although we've made quite a bit of progress in scheduling and, uh, and other uh, issues around uh, managing the workflow. And then finally, uh, a major issue has always been what happens with the information. So you do a visit, where does it go? Do you have the patient's electronic medical record? Can you integrate the information where it needs to be? Can the patient get the information? Can you pass it on to their regular caregivers? And all those, all those questions. Next slide. So one of the things that many people have been working on for many years now um, are automating clinical and business decision support processes and information flow. So this slide in the middle shows what I call a care bubble. Um, and this has been sort of referred to a number of times here already, which is where the point of care decisions are made, which means this is where the doctor or another clinician and the patient work together. So whether that's virtual or whether that's in, in, uh, in person, there are things that simply have to be done by two people interacting with one another because the uh, the practice the um, outcome of a diagnosis and treatment plan is a very complex cognitive decision task which right now can be done by a machine nor can clinical judgment be rendered uh, nor can steps of inference for the most part be made however all of the information that you need to do those things in the pro in the in the presence of a patient can can theoretically be automated, including the issues around triage and is this an appropriate place for the patient to be? Should they be on a virtual visit or should they be somewhere else? So uh, analytic and process automation form the basis of this development process. And then on the outs on the downside from the visit, uh, we have reports, requests, and process automation, the integration of new technologies around uh, connected devices, around uh, natural language processing, chatbots, uh, and avatars, and other and other types of technologies that can extend um, and meet the needs of the patient after the visit. Next slide. So uh, back to the back to my four barriers: who pays, who's licensed, who answers, and and how's information get integrated. I just wanted to list a few things, a few of the areas where. Uh, technology is being expanded and beginning to address some of these issues. Um, so who pays clearly during this, um, during this current period? Um, there have been expansions and loosening of the rules around who pays for what. Nevertheless, Medicare Advantage and Managed Medicaid systems are rapidly adopting telehealth for efficiency reasons as much as anything else. Uh, so are the other payment plans and a lot of integrated health systems. And if you look at the, um, Commercial side with companies like Teladoc and Livongo, uh, they struggled mightily until they were able to garner contracts with CMS, uh, with the other payers and with healthcare systems. And now they're growing extremely rapidly because they happen to be at the right place at the right time primarily. So regulatory, I'm not gonna cover. We've heard a lot about that already. Uh, workflow and scheduling uh, are, are taking uh, advances by leaps and bounds. Uh, we've developed a number of what I call the Uber model, which is uh, when you have a health system uh, with a number of providers participating in uh, telehealth, you can uh, access the person in real time who's available. 
uh, uh, and as appropriate person for a visit. Um, process and analytic automation in the care bubble I've already talked about. Uh, I would like to say that add in the automation of physiologic sensors and patient reports and care management apps, and uh, you begin to see how you could expand uh, the offering of virtual visits. And then finally, how does information get integrated? Um, connected medical devices, devices and data exchange are the main ways. Um, I wanna uh, make a mention of the fire-based interoperability and exchange technology and, and standard that's now being adopted, not only by the government, but by also by public servers and services such as Amazon, AWS, Microsoft, Azure, Google, and Apple. <clears throat> Next, please. And then finally, patient acceptance clearly has been pretty good. Um, this is one example of a, of a survey recently that showed that uh, a fair number of people, uh, patients in, in community health plans <clears throat> had access to telehealth and had had a good experience. To, for widespread acceptance in any kind of health care technology, there's a three-part value proposition that must be served. Those value propositions are the buyer, the person paying for the service, the user, usually clinical people, and the beneficiary, usually the patient, of a technologically-based service, all have a different value proposition, and each of those value propositions must be met in order for acceptance to occur. Here are, here are the two companies I mentioned before, Livongo and Teladoc, and you can see in the first corner of 2020, uh, they're both publicly traded companies, and they both grew over 100%. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how faster they grew in the current quarter. Next slide. Just want to end with two uh, types of technology extensions that are that are becoming popular out there, where we see a lot of development work right now. This is an example of an ERAS system, an enhanced recovery after surgery system, that was developed primarily for knee and hip replacements, uh, particularly as bundled payments were being developed, and so. This is a very typical structure for this kind of a product. Uh, you have a, an advanced sensor device, a mobile application, and a care management uh, uh, central core. And uh, in this case, that little round device on the leg right there uh, measures um, range of motion. It measures, it measures the type of movement, how many movements, and all those things. It goes to the app. So that, uh, which also is the way that a patient communicates with the care management team and also gets automated um, alerts and information. And then in the back end, not only do you have where people are uh, that can also uh, reach the patient, but also collecting the data and doing advanced analytics. Next one. I'll just finish up with this one um, because it it's really uh, goes from triage to monitoring very large populations. So you can see what's called the halo device there. That little piece of plastic that's laid up across that quarter there uh, is a miniaturized uh, multi-modality uh, vital signs measuring system that's not invasive. You can see the five vital signs that it measures there on the slide. Uh, it clips to the back of the ear. It's, uh, it actually tapes to the back of the ear. Uh, as I say, it's non-invasive in that little box that transmits the, the signal. The signal can go to any kind of a mobile device. In this case, uh, it, there's a tablet. It could monitor up to 100 uh, signals from 100 different people uh, and, then, and then be transmitted to what they call their command cloud, which is essentially an infinitely scalable uh, database uh, that can that can capture as many of these kinds of signals as you want and then be subject eventually to additional analytics for research and insights. So I just wanted to end up with some direction of where uh, we think um, telehealth is going to go. These kinds of monitoring devices like the one on this slide um, are, are fairly tailor-made for use at home. Uh, they're not completely um, they're not completely uh, patient friendly yet, but they're getting there uh, rapidly. And, um, and I think we're running out of time. So uh, I'm going to turn it back to uh, the moderator. And thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, Bob and Cliff. And I, yeah, I will now turn it back over to, to Nancy to close out.